So let's start with sequences. What is a sequence? Formally defined, a sequence is a function whose domain is a set of all natural numbers, denoted by this fancy looking uppercase n, or the set of the first n natural numbers. Now you're probably like, well what does that mean? Asa, couldn't you just define a sequence like every other video does, that it is just an order list of numbers? Well yeah, I could, because that is exactly what a sequence is. But trust me, this is not the kind of definition you want to dumb down. In fact, you shouldn't dumb down any definition when it comes to math. It's just intellectually lazy. But this one especially don't, because it'll prove useful later on, such as in Calc 2. So let's instead make some sense out of it. Well, you know what a function is. A function is simply an operator that takes any range of input values and assigns exactly one output value for every one input value. And you should definitely be familiar with domain. It is the range of values the input values take for any particular function. Take for example the function f of x equals x squared. Here, the domain is all the numbers on the real number line, including x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals negative 0.5, x equals radical 2, or x equals pi, and so on. Anything but imaginary numbers. And for every real value number, we have exactly one output value. We have 1 squared or 1 for f of 1, 2 squared or 4 for f of 2, negative 0.5 squared or 0.25 for f of negative 0.5, 2 for f of radical 2, and pi squared for f of pi, and so on. Plotting the following curve on our Cartesian coordinate. However, going with the sequence definition, a sequence's domain is only natural numbers instead of real. But what are natural numbers? There are basically numbers that are used for counting such as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. The positive integers. When you count, you say stuff like 1 like, 100 subscriptions, or 3,460 follows. You never say negative 10 dislikes or 1.5 shares. That just doesn't make any sense. Now some books count 0 and some don't. Meaning, some books say the natural numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, while others just say they are 1, 2, 3, and so on. Depending on the book you're using, it's up to you on whether you want to include 0 or not. Here though, by default I will include 0, but will mention when I won't. That way you get familiar with both cases. So by using this fact and applying it to f of x equals x squared, we then get a function whose x values are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And we plot only 0 for f of 0, 1 for f of 1, 4 for f of 2, 9 for f of 3, and so on. Getting a list of squares of numbers in increasing order. 0, 1, 4, 9, 16. Hence where the dumbed down definition of a sequence being an order list of numbers comes from. Now notice how the sequence is infinite. Only because its input values went from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and on to infinity. Taking into account all possible natural numbers as a domain. But the definition also says, or the first n natural numbers. This implies a finite sequence, meaning only n output values for n input values. So in result, a sequence can be finite or infinite. To better understand this, let's say for f of x equals x squared, we had nb6 instead. Then our sequence would be finite and end at 36, right? Other examples of sequences are 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, and so on. A sequence alternating between the values negative 1 and 1. 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. A sequence of increasing even numbers. 3, 3.1, 3.14, 3.141, 3.1415. A sequence that starts with the first digit of pi and adds one more digit of pi by each term. And lastly, radical 2, radical of 2 plus radical 2, radical of 2 plus radical of 2 plus radical 2, and so on. All these sequences have the domain of natural numbers. So that's the formality broken down. Now let's go on to notation. Now this topic is sort of a gray area, as many books will follow a certain notation, and others will go completely the opposite. Here though, I am going to just go with what I feel will intuitively work the best and allow for the least possible conflict with notations of other math terminology. In the end though, it's up to you on what makes sense to you. So let's go. So first off, sequences are usually written out with their terms listed, with commas in between terms and parentheses surrounding it all. We don't have to use parentheses, we can use the curly brace, angled brace, or even nothing as some books do. However, one thing I'll tell you for sure. 
You want to avoid curly braces at all costs. Repeat, you want to avoid curly braces at all costs. Why? Because curly braces are specifically used for sets. And unless mentioned otherwise, a sequence with curly braces will always be treated like a set. So you want to avoid that confusion. And angled braces, although not so much, I'd say don't use them either because then they'll look like vectors. So parentheses should do. And I know some of you may say that parentheses are used for order tuples when graphing. But let's be real. When are we really going to talk about an order tuple of say above three values? Say for like the XYZ plane. A sequence most often has amount of values well above that. So there should never really be confusion when using parentheses. Second, if a sequence is too long to write, which it most often is, you just write enough terms until the pattern can be discerned and then write dot dot or the ellipsis to imply the sequence goes on. You leave it like this for infinite sequences. For finite sequences, you write the last couple of terms after the dot dot. For example, for the finite sequence of squares, we just write 1, 4, 9, and then dot dot because 1, 4, 9 should be enough for the reader to deduce that it is a sequence of increasing squares going on forever. But if the sequence was finite and ended at n equals 20, we would just write 1, 4, 9, dot dot, 361, and 400. Because the sequence ends at 361 and then 400, which are 19 squared and 20 squared respectively, the 19th and 20th terms. Here are other examples of infinite sequences versus finite sequences right now. I suggest you pause and analyze them before moving on. Next, instead of using the f of x notation, we are going to let our independent variable be n and use the a sub n notation, specifically to define a sequence. Where instead of writing f of 1 for x equals 1, or f of 2 for x equals 2, we instead write a sub n for n equals 1, a sub 2 for n equals 2, and so on. Using the sequence a sub n equals n squared, for example, instead of saying our y value for x equals 1 is 1, or our y value for x equals 2 is 4, we say our first term is 1, or a sub 1 is 1, our second term, or a sub 2 is 4, our third term, or a sub 3 is 9, and so on. This is key because by saying first term, second term, and so on, your mind instinctively starts imagining a sequence as counting a list of numbers, which is what a sequence is. Now just a quick side note concerning independent variables. Notice how I mentioned our independent variable was n? Well, it doesn't have to be. Just as a function could be f of x with the independent variable x or f of y with the independent variable y, a sequence can be denoted by other independent variables as well, such as i and k, as shown. So don't panic if you see a sequence written out with anything but n. I'm using n only because it is the most common. Lastly, we don't have to write out our sequence as a list. If it clearly follows a pattern such as a sequence of increasing squares or cubes, we can just shorten it and write a sub n equals parentheses n squared or a sub n equals parentheses n cubed respectively. We don't have to write out a sub n equals 1, 4, 9, dot dot or a sub n equals 1, 8, 27, dot dot each time. Here are some further examples of sequences with their shortened notation and list notation. You can pause and analyze them if you need to. Now that I have formally defined broken down, went over the notation of, and gave examples of a few sequences, you should be pretty damn good in familiarizing yourself with sequences. Now let's talk about series. Well, just like sequences are a list of numbers, series are just a summation of those numbers from a sequence. For example, for our first sequence of a sub n equals n squared, the sequence starting out with n equals 0, or the 0th term, is 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, and so on. However, the corresponding series is 0 plus 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus 25 plus all the rest of the terms. At first glance, you might think that doing this is pointless, as 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus so on clearly equals infinity or diverges. Like what are we possibly going to do with this information that something adds up to infinity? But don't get too hasty yet. Series are important as some series as you'll find later on when you reach calculus, always add up to a specific value or converge to that value, regardless of whether we have finite terms for a finite series or infinite terms for an infinite series. Take for example the infinite series of inverse squares, 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth plus 1 twenty fifth and so on. It can be proven that this series equals pi squared over 6. The proof though is well beyond the scope of this video. 
Not only that, if you have a finite series of the first 11 terms of 2 to the n starting with n equals 0 and going all the way to n equals 10, it can be shown that this finite series converges to 2047. And by having these sum values, pi squared and 6, and by having these sum values, pi squared over 6 and 2047 respectively, we actually have some pieces of information to analyze. Basically, the point I am trying to get across is that series are important. They especially get useful in calculus, so value the time you learn them. And just like we have simplified notation for sequences, so do we for series. Just like sequences are represented with a sub n, series are represented with s sub n, the uppercase s. And instead of writing out 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus so on, if you know that our series clearly follows a pattern, in this case, this is an infinite series of squares, we can just shorten it into summation notation and write out our series like this. Now don't get intimidated by this. This fancy looking E you see here is just the uppercase Greek letter sigma. And all it means is that we take the sum of the terms that obey the following rule, in this case n squared, written to the very next of the sigma, from n equals 1 written on the bottom of the sigma, all the way to infinity written on the top of the sigma. In other words, we start with n equals 1 and have 1, then n equals 2 and add 4, then n equals 3 and add 9, and so on, all the way to infinity, getting our series written in the long notation. Similarly, if we had this, all this would mean is we add terms following the rule 3 to the n from n equals 3 all the way to n equals capital N. So we start with 3 cubed or 27, add 3 to the 4th or 81, add 3 to the 5th or 243, and so on, all the way to 3 to the n minus 1, and then 3 to the n. You should get the idea by now of summation notation. Here are some more examples in case you need to pause and look through it more. So yeah, there's a brief intro of what series and sequences are. This should be enough for you to get a familiarization. Soon, I will make videos covering specific sequences and series, such as recursive sequences and series, such as the Fibonacci sequence, sequence and series of integers, squares, and cubes, arithmetic and geometric sequences and series, and further into calculus covering the concept of convergence and divergence, and lastly, the power, the tailor, and binomial. And that should roughly be about five more videos just on the topic of sequences. So definitely stay tuned for that. And if you like what you learned, make sure to hit the like button as well as the subscribe button. As always, thanks for watching.